so first of all, like, do, do you experience like the 1355, 2212 as like a full continuity? Like, do you consider that to be one wave or are those separate waves? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I feel like I can feel the difference between them, but they do kind of blend in. So with the 1222, what I noticed the most about that one is just how social I am when it's up and how much I want to talk. I'm like a chatterbox when that wave is up um, versus the 3955 feels more adrenalized when it's up. It feels like I want to go move my body. I want to dance. I want to um, do something physical to release that or even just get out of the house and explore, you know, it's more of like this adrenalized push. Whereas the 1222 just feels a lot more social where it's like, I want to be around people. I want to talk to a friend. I want to express myself. Um, you know, I, I have a podcast and I tend to record those episodes when I'm up because it's just, I need to talk when I'm in that space. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Fa famously social, right. The, the, the most beloved individual channel by the tribe, right. Is the 2212 <laughs> people love to hear right. it. Yes. People love to hear it. And it's great because when I'm up and I'm in that space, I love to express and I love to have an audience. So looks like Christina in the chat is asking about your 596. And I also do, I'm, I'm, I'm also just curious for people that have um, melancholy attached to the wave and those other emotional channels you have, whether the highs and lows of the wave always come with um, melancholy, you know, whether, whether those are like, could, can a mutation, <laughs> well, we could get the Christine's question first. Cause I, um, I could get a little more specific about my question and I'm just, I'm just finding it relating to a couple other things too. So, um, yeah. but I just, um, yeah. and, cause also just like with, and keeping in mind the audience or whatever, and just like people's, um, I think everyone kind of cleaves apart or learns to cleave apart the like low end of the wave from melancholy, um, depending on how those things are defined in their own charts. But just like conceptually, when people get into human design and start to consider like a low wave being a different thing from melancholy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was something in your talk that helped me a lot, too, because I didn't really notice the difference consciously before. And then I started going through it with awareness of yeah, my low is just a general low energy and disinterest in everything. And how you had said when you're in melancholy, you could still have energy. And it's just that you're very specific and kind of irritated by things that are not the specific thing that you need. Um, so I started paying attention to that. And it's very different. It's a very different feeling because I feel like when I'm in melancholy, I'm almost searching for something. I'm searching for the thing that's going to scratch the itch. And sometimes I can have a lot of energy while I'm on the search for that. Like if I have a specific craving, I'm going to go try to find it. I'm going to go try to make it happen now. Whereas in a low, it just feels like I have no energy to do anything and I'm disinterested in life pretty much. Mm. Yeah. And the question about the 59.6, is there something specific that you wanted to know, Christine, about that? Just like what it feels like or... Uh, maybe that was that was prob that question was probably posed shortly after um, you uh, sort of making distinct your thirty nine fifty five from your twenty two twelve, and I would assume that she's probably just wondering how that fits into the um, the aggregate of the circuit of the emotional circuitry that you have. Yeah, um, it's hard for me to differentiate. I mean, that one's completely unconscious for me, so it does feel like it's more of a body thing. I will notice, and this is something James Alexander's kind of helped me with as well as noticing what specific triggers I have. And although the wave is just a chemistry that's moving along, of course, I notice there are times where I do get like a spike of energy there or um, like a, an outside situation that kind of sets a wave off or that's what it feels like to me. And with the 59.6, it's, it's tribal. So it typically is like friction in my interpersonal relationships or um, sometimes it's feeling a lack of intimacy in my relationships will kind of set that off. And if I'm in a low, I could really kind of dwell on that and be like, oh, do I not have intimacy in my relationships? Do people not trust me? Um, and 
when there's conflict or friction, it kind of sets off a whole thing for me to start processing. And I have to, you know, move through that in my own way. And then also having closure or conversation with the person that there might be friction with becomes really important to me, like when the timing is right. Mm. Are you, um, are, do you have the chat open here where you're getting a whole bunch of kind of interesting questions and people are kind yeah. of uh, debating things among themselves? Yes, absolutely. Um, you're, you're seeing all that? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very active chat. For this yeah, I love it. I'm here for it. <laughs> yeah. And um, just to differentiate what Mark had said, uh, melancholy is individual. So I don't want the 596 to get lumped into that. It's, definitely tribal so you do have four individual channels right would you are you able to um get a sense of when one channel in particular might be mutating do you experience different kinds of melancholy that you can um link together by category like that oh yeah yeah actually that um that chart that i think christine shared Mm. That was really helpful because that actually just laid it all out for me so I could read it and be like, oh my gosh, everything (laughs) makes sense now. Um, Because I, before I really knew what was happening, I would call it like an existential crisis because it would be, it it felt to me like I was having some sort of meltdown. And yeah, that could be (laughs) amplified by my emotions and stuff, but it would be around very specific things. And so, um, the 2838 and like life is devoid of purpose and not knowing what to fight for. I've noticed that that melancholy, what that feels like is it's like, I will start questioning all of my life decisions and wondering why I'm not fighting for something right now or why I'm not struggling for something. And when I'm in the midst of building something and struggling and fighting for something, it's like, there's almost a, really um what's the word I'm looking for there's like an adrenaline that comes with that like a rush and Mm. I've been through different phases of my life where I've been actively like fighting for something and having this meaning in my life and then you know life just changes and we move on to something else and whatever and and then it just feels like I'm waiting for something else to come along to fight for and so I feel like when I go into that melancholy my mind kind of can have a heyday with that of like this is why you're in, you're in this space because you don't have anything worth fighting for. And so Mm. it's really interesting to listen to the mental chatter because it it doesn't really matter. Right. But I, yeah, I, I just, it's more that I witness my mind in those spaces and what conclusions it's drawing based upon my melancholy. And, and with the channel of struggle, I will like, my mind will tell me I need to change a bunch of things, or it's almost like it's wanting me to create struggle to get me out of that melancholy versus just Mm. allowing the mutation to happen. And I think that's where for somebody like me, it's so important to be tuned into my emotional authority and not making any of these life changing decisions because I'm in a space of melancholy and I'm trying to scratch that itch somehow, according to my mind, you know? Mm. It's kind of interesting to see that channel is like a parallel of the 3955 and earlier when you're talking about um, like eating to fill a void or whatever. I feel like sometimes a channel of struggle can be like doing to fill a void, like something like uh, straining yourself towards improving something, tra- straining yourself toward like uh, filling filling an external void with activity or something. Because like when you're feeling void of meaning, it's like, well, I got to put this like fight energy somewhere. Yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And it's interesting having both of those channels that mirror each other and kind of feeling some similarities, also major differences. But um, yeah, it's like it's trying to get me to be in some sort of struggle. (laughs) It's like you need something to fight for. Uh, can I just keep asking questions? Yeah, go for <laughs> I, it. I kind of gave up on following the chat because it was hard to like <laughs> read while listening to you. Um, <laughs> sorry, chat. Um, so, uh, so you know that thing about like, so it de- like melancholic episodes definitely make you like more internal, right? You're like more self preoccupied, more like introspective. Like, do you f- first of all do you find that to be true? Yes, absolutely. I I find that I just 
don't want to be around people a lot of the time. And um, my schedule as it is now, like I only work two days a week at this restaurant. And so it kind of works perfectly because it gets me out of the house and gets me doing something. But for the rest of the week, I'm, I'm really keeping to myself and I'm able to kind of tend to my moods and, um, you know, make my own schedule with my clients and whatnot. And switching to a schedule like that. I mean, obviously that's kind of a luxury. I didn't used to have a schedule like this pre 2020, but I've noticed it's opened up so much more space for me to be by myself in that melancholy and, um, be antisocial and not feel bad about it. Mm. And that, so in my case, like all my experiences of, of melancholy that, that belong to me, at least that are like native to my circuitry, um, n- none of those involve the throat. So I'm also curious, um, just this process, especially cause you know, that one, um, throat channel specifically that you have is so much about opening up or not. Um, do you find that when acute melancholy strikes, there are, um, certain things that you are able to talk about still? Cause, cause for me a bit like my experience of, um, of melancholy and like the antisocialness that comes with it is like, it's really excruciating to talk about in a way, maybe this is like 61, 24, really hard to talk about things that like, aren't true. Like I can't stand a conversation where you people have to like contrive answers and have good enough, true enough answers or talk about things they don't know about. Right. Cause I guess it's betraying that sort of like gate of inner truth with that. But, mm. um, but some, but it's like, and I can think that I just don't want to like talk at all to anybody. Like I've, it feels like no subject on there under the sun could capture my attention, but just like with everything else in melancholy, sometimes it's just super, super specific. And, um, and like the closer, the closer to <laughs> talking about myself as I can get, like the easier I find it to, um, express. And sometimes in a state of melancholy, I'll like surprise myself with how much I have to share and how much I'm lit up when I'm able to talk about something that I know to be true, which is my state of melancholy. Right. <laughs> and when yes. you're in melancholy, it's like, that's one of the, one of the things that you can appreciate is where you're at. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was thinking that at first because sometimes when I'm in melancholy, it just feels like I have no voice. And like like you said, it's painful to talk or my voice is just shut down. But I've experienced it before. Maybe this is being a fourth line and having the right people in my network where let's say I'll, I'll wake up in melancholy and I'm kind of just like I barely have said a word and the day's half over or whatever. And then the right person will call me or reach out to me. And they'll ask me the right question and it just opens something up, you know? And then, like you said, I'm able to talk about my melancholy, talk about what's going on. Um, Yeah, it just seems like it's like everything else with melancholy is very specific. And I just get, it's almost like it's depleting or exhausting to talk about whatever is not specific, you know? Mm. What's unspecific. That's really interesting. Yeah. You specific to your mood, you mean? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like whatever, mm-hmm. if I have to talk, like, let's say I'm at work when I'm in melancholy, I have to talk about something that is not specific. It's like, it's hard to get it out. I feel like my voice is suppressed almost or shut down. Mm. Oh, uh, we, we did, uh, had a question in the chat pointed out to us again. Um, it, is the experience of melancholy different between, um, hanging gates versus channels? Mm, yeah. I mean, I feel like, um, you had talked a little bit about that in your talk, how it can feel when you are, when you have the hanging gate and it was either if you're compromised in that channel with somebody or if there's a electromagnetic and what that can feel like. Um, I would, I would imagine that it would depend on if it was coming off of a defined or an undefined center to like how often you experience that. Do you think that would be the case? Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. How, and how um, familiar are you with that kind of melancholy? Because it, it, it's like, you're more likely to surprise yourself with a mood if that mood is not um, something that you're carrying around in some form all the time. Like, you know, when melancholy strikes and you have and you have the mood and you know that the mutation's happening under the surface, it's still like kind of in your wheelhouse when it's part of your um circuitry, when it's part of a complete channel. Yeah. But 
But like, oh, oh, it's really clear to me when I'm um, when I'm getting a melancholy inspired by a transit or an aura that's where it's just I don't have a hanging gate there at all. You know, like the that uh, prolonged 63 transit to me really stood out as just a type of melancholy that I was not used to. Yes. Yeah. I, it's interesting because with as much melancholy as I have, that kind of stuff can still really throw me off because it feels so different to what I'm used to. So the 63 transit, it just felt like kind of moving through sludge or it almost brought up more for my mind to think about and like, why isn't anything happening? Why am I so bored all the time? (laughs) Um, Mm. Yeah, it's almost like very obvious. It almost uh, clouds my regular melancholy that I feel because that's just normally a part of my process and I'm used to it. But when something new comes in, you notice it in other people a lot too. It's like, it's kind of a topic of conversation with people. Mm. I'm curious about this keynote for the melancholy of gate 20, discomfort with the world as it is now. Yeah, I was uh, looking at that earlier on on Nathan's chart, and it that feels very appropriate. <laughs> I feel like if I'm in melancholy in that in in the gate twenty, I'm kind of looking around, and I'm also you know on personal view, so I can transfer to power view too, and be seeing the power dynamics or that are that don't feel fair to me and wanting something to change. I mean, especially with what's going on right now in the world. And I can just see how it's, it's like a sadness about Mm. why things are the way that they are and wishing that things were different and wishing that we could be more in the future and things would be mutating versus sitting with the discomfort of what's actually happening in the present. Mm, yeah, I I definitely associate that theme with the 5720 specifically. It's interesting. So you've got the 1020 and um and you know that you know that's not known to be an existential channel in the same way, right? As being part of integration. It's it's um it's being existential instead of thinking about existential things or whatever as the 5720 might. Yeah. Um but you know the like it's it's interesting that that just that phrase discomfort with the world as it is now because there's the world that you're talking about you know that you uh, uh, absorb through inference you know you hear about the world out there you see evidence of the world out there like things happening in other places and whatnot but there's also the world as it is now that's like literally in your now like a- around you right and do you feel that when um your 1020 melancholy strikes up that it's very like, I don't know, immediate in your face or in the room with you somehow. Yeah, I could totally see that. Yeah. Cause I was, I was thinking while you were talking, there's the world at large and then there's my own world. And that's, I, I just remember being a little kid and like complaining about boredom was the thing I complained about the most. And, um, I feel like because gate 20 is about being present, I can tend to not be present. And when I'm not being present, that's when I notice I have a problem with it. Like if I'm just like, oh, I wish it were different right now. I wish I was doing something else or talking to somebody or whatever it is. It's like my mind is Mm. looking for problems in my world, in my present Mm. awareness. And, And then it's like that's where dissociation can come in or where I'm just trying to distract myself and, um, change my present moment wow like i'm in the wrong place yeah yeah totally yeah and then i wonder with the gate 10 because it's melancholy that no one else knows how to behave and i also have that (laughs) in um the sixth line i mean that's something you know 10.6 we can be hypocrites (laughs) we can um i i wonder too because i can you know kind of swing from self-love to self-hate and that's seems like a character arc that those of us with that defined in our charts go through um but yeah it's almost like having a problem with my own behavior sometimes like why am i behaving this way why am i not behaving differently um as well as other people's behavior Mm. yeah it makes sense the gate of self-love would also be the gate of self-hatred yeah absolutely um I kind of want to deep dive on uh, on individual versus integration some more, but there's a lot of good questions in the 
in the comments and um and we might lose them if we don't get to them so do you mind if i just kind of okay. go in order here yeah go for it Okay, so Amanda asks um, or says, I relate to a lot of what you're saying regarding moodiness slash pickiness. Of course, I have no channels, but a, but a 12 design sun, 61, 23, and 38, and 60 to 3 was a trip as well. Oh, yeah, re Reflector talking about the transit, of course. Nice. So that's, oh, yeah. Yeah, moodiness, pickiness. Uh, Jonah says, and Nathan's keynoting, 60 is melancholy of having nowhere to go, and 3 is melancholy of nothing everlasting. Whoa, that's interesting. Mm. So an interesting perspective of the 60 to 3 transit we just went through for the past three months as well. Good point, Jonah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I, like, started reading these, I thought they were questions, and then some, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes they're just uh, <laughs> observations, some, some insightful observations. observations here. They are, they are. I want to read <laughs> Ashley's, too. Let's see. It says... With just one individual channel, the 3828, I feel like most of my life I'm melancholic slash sad. But honestly, the big breakthrough has been learning to enjoy it, basically. Not just channeling it because it can be utilized in everything I do, but just savoring the sadness. Courting the muse, I guess, is how Ra put it. Um, she also says that, yeah, that's a really good line, courting the muse. Um, she also says that she thinks the biggest deconditioning has been assuming people would find it unpleasant to be around or melancholy, but that's just not true. I guess it itself is mutated for people. Yeah, it is. Like, it's hard not to think that when you're like deep in a melancholy because you're so antisocial, like it's, it's very, very easy to just feel like a pill. And why would anyone want to hang out with me? Like when you're deep in a mood. And sometimes I feel like I get reinforcement from that. Sometimes I think my my heaviness and my melancholic state can be legitimately uninvited, and it's not just my um, my black holeness that's telling me that. But then you can really be surprised at how receptive the right people are at the right time to the mutation. Yeah, totally. Especially when you're just owning it and like stating it versus just sitting in. The energy of it i think it can be refreshing for people when you're just like oh i'm just in a mood today and that's mm. what it is and I'm, and some people i think the thing i experience the most is people will be like oh i'm sorry or well what's wrong what happened and i'm like nothing <laughs> it's just my state of being right now and i think if if i'm in a certain mood that can be really annoying to get that from people because it's almost reinforcing what my mind latches on to that there's something wrong with me um, but I think I've gotten to a point where I'm just comfortable owning it. And I just know that people just don't always understand it. And that's their first instinct is just to want to apologize for like, cause they feel like you're complaining about it when you're just saying <laughs> it versus like, you know, it's like, Oh, you, you want sympathy from me. And that's why you're saying this. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just being honest of where I'm at right now. That's so real. That's so true. And it, and it, it's clear at the time too, that that's like one of the most valuable things you can do for yourself. Like the, the effect of it is like pretty immediate when you start talking about your mood and it doesn't necessarily have to be venting or, um, or even grieving really. It's just, it's again, it's like just speaking to the truth of the mood and all the, you know, unpleasantness that that might contain. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, this is the kind of discomfort that I'm experiencing right now, but I'm also very accepting of it. Right. Yeah. It's like fleshing it out and it's easier to accept it when you give words to it. You know, it's like it, the, yeah. the, the sort of um, catharsis effect kind of happens immediately. Yeah, absolutely. 